The Obersalzberg, nestled in the majestic Bavarian Alps, is not only renowned for its natural beauty, but also for its tragic role during the Second World War. In a time of intense military activities and strategic decisions, the picturesque slopes of the Obersalzberg became a symbolic target for Allied bombing raids. This documentary delves into the history of these attacks, illuminating their significance within the context of the war and examining their impact on the region and its inhabitants. From the initial air raids to the destruction of once grand structures, this documentary offers a captivating insight into a chapter of history that continues to leave its mark on the Bavarian Alps to this day. Please enjoy this new video, and if you like it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. The dawn of 1939 marked a pivotal turning point for the construction efforts on the Obersalzberg, as the outbreak of war drastically altered the landscape and trajectory of development in the region. Trucks were subject to fuel quotas and building materials could not be delivered as usual. Nevertheless, Bormann pushed ahead with the procurement of materials by classifying the entire construction work on Obersalzberg as a special construction project of the Führer that was important for the war effort. While all men throughout the Reich were called up for military service, the skilled workers at Obersalzberg were exempted on the basis of emergency certificates. There was only one restriction on the construction of the oberau rossfeld klaushoa road. The workers and engineers were either drafted into the Wehrmacht or the organization taught. Only a small number of people were still employed on the Obersalzberg to carry out the remaining work that was absolutely necessary. In addition, in February 1939, planning began for the Klaushoa housing development, about one kilometer east of the Platterhof. Bormann wanted a model settlement, with every conceivable extra. Employees of the Ober Salzburg administration and the SS administration were to live here, party loyalists. Albert Speer's repeated attempts to stop Bormann's building frenzy were unsuccessful. All the buildings on Obersalzberg were codenamed Führer buildings, and everything had to be done for them. Fourteen single-family homes and five townhouses were built. Today, only those buildings are still in existence that were not damaged by the bombing. About one mile to the east, construction of a second settlement began simultaneously, the Buchenhuhe. These buildings were financed by the Adolf Hitler donation from the German Economic Society. The settlement was to be exceptional in its kind. A school, a department store, restaurants, an industrial laundry, and a district heating system for the supply of all the buildings on the Ober Salzburg were planned and built. Up to 6,000 tons of steel per month were used to build the district heating plant. This was an enormous amount of steel that was urgently in demand by the armaments industry. Ober Salzburg began to feel the effects of the war in 1942, after the German troops were pushed back by the Red Army counter-offensive. Measures were taken at various points in the Berchtesgaden Valley to defend against air raids. All workers fit for war were transferred to the front. The resulting gaps were filled by workers from the occupied territories. The so-called P Barrack in Unterau, six kilometers away, was particularly popular with foreign workers. This brothel had been authorized by Bormann during the construction of the Eagle's Nest in order to protect female workers in the canteens from molestation by the men. As prostitution was forbidden by the law of the Reich, it was mainly girls from Italy and France who worked in the establishment.
The bombing of German cities began in the spring of 1942. As southern German cities became more and more the target of Allied air raids, the construction of air raid shelters began on Bormann's orders in July 1943. Initially, only one bunker was to be built for Hitler and Eva Braun. Dr. Pretzel, a tunnel engineer at the time, recalls, First, they built the Hitler bunker, and then Bormann said he needed protection for his people. And then it went on and on. Always bigger, always a little more, including the tunnel to the Platterhof. There were more and more people, so new tunnels were blasted and reinforced with concrete. There were no plans because everything was secret. You had to keep asking how things were going to go on and so on. In the evening, they'd say that they'd have to do another tunnel tomorrow because there wasn't enough space and so on. If you want to see the full interview with Dr. Pretzel, check out the links in the description of this video. We will post the full video there. By the end of the war, the Ober Salzburg Tunnel Company had built about 5,700 meters or 3.5 miles of tunnels and a total of about 100 caverns. With the Allied landings in Normandy in mid-1944, Germany faced the two-front war that Stalin had long demanded. Under the supreme command of General Eisenhower, 326,000 men landed in Normandy within six days. Under the codename Overlord, the fortress of Europe was attacked with over 6,000 ships and almost 15,000 bombers and fighters. On July 14, 1944, Hitler left Obersalzburg and moved to his headquarters in Rostenburg, East Prussia. As he left Obersalzburg, he is said to have said, I will either return victorious, or I will never see this mountain again. Change of location, Führer headquarters in Berlin. In February 1945, Bormann asked Grand Admiral Dönitz for one of the most advanced mobile communications vehicles to be sent to Obersalzburg. It took up a position above the Platterhof at what was known as the Klingek, and was immediately made ready for use. From here, encrypted messages could be sent and received with above-average transmission and reception performance. Thanks to a tip from a former radio operator who was stationed at Obersalzburg during the last weeks of the war, we were recently able to locate an underground facility. Exactly how this facility functioned and served remains a mystery, and has never been solved. A few meters below the surface, we discovered a domed room of about a hundred square meters. One of the many unsolved mysteries of Obersalzburg is the original purpose of the complex. If you want to find out more about this mysterious place, check out our video Secret Mission N2, Hitler's Emergency Depot. You will find a link to that documentary in the description of this video. The destruction of Obersalzburg by the Allies towards the end of the war was carried out according to plans for the attack that had been drawn up as early as 1944. The strict security measures at Obersalzburg made espionage almost impossible. Therefore, the Allied secret services had only vague descriptions of the area to be bombed. As a result, the Americans designated the Eagle's Nest as the primary target. The secondary target was Hitler's Berghof, which was also incorrectly named Haus Wachenfels in the attack plans. The Americans had always suspected an underground command center beneath the Eagle's Nest. At 9.35 a.m. on April 25th in 1945, 318 Lancaster bombers of the Royal Air Force carried out a three-hour raid on Ubersalzburg. The SS barracks below the Platterhof can be seen in the square arrangement of buildings in the center of this photo. Hermann Goering, who had been arrested at his Obersalzburg home two days earlier as part of a plot by Bormann, witnessed the raid from his bunker below the house. 
His former housekeeper remembers the first bombs cut off our electricity and water, destroyed by bombs. So we sat there in the dark. There weren't enough candles either. There were over 120 of us down in the bunker, with soldiers, guards, and so on. The children had diarrhea from the excitement. It was a catastrophic situation. After the first big wave was over, we thought it was over, but then it started again. There was a crazy amount of pressure down there because the last people who had gone into the bunker hadn't closed the safety doors. Crazy waves of pressure were coming down into our shelters, and some of them were blowing open the steel doors that we had down there. The children were terrified. Even the older ones panicked. All you could hear between the explosions was mommy, mommy, mommy. We went down on Wednesday and had to stay in the shelter until Thursday night. The employees who were still at Hitler's secret headquarters at the time of the attack also sought refuge in the Berghof bunker. The former caretakers, the Mittelstrassers, remember. Some employees from Berlin were already stationed here for security reasons at the time of the attack. Things were even worse in Berlin at the time. The Berlin staff didn't want to come with us when the attack came, and we all fled to the bunker. Those guys thought that nothing was going to happen anyway. We were all in the bunker by then, and my husband was the last one to join us. He was thrown down the last part of the stairs by the shock waves as he was going down. That's how powerful the bombs were. If you want to watch one of these interview in full length, check out the links in the video description. The bunkers on the Obersalzburg mountain may have been far too large, but they were not built for nothing. More than 3,000 workers found safe haven in the bunkers. Only eight people were killed in the attack. Had it not been for the Obersalzburg bunker system, the death toll would probably have been in the thousands. When Hitler received the news of the destruction of the Berghof in his Führer bunker in Berlin, the battle for the Reich's capital was already in its apocalyptic final phase. The Russians were already in the heart of Berlin. The Obersalzberg also presented a picture of devastation. The damage to the Berghof had been relatively light. Some heavy damage had been done to Bormann's house on the left. The Platterhof here in the background was also badly damaged but was repaired in the following years. It was used as a military hospital at the time of the attack. The SS barracks, the Kasernenhof and the Dienstwagenhalle were also hit. Göring's house was also heavily damaged. The Eagle's Nest was the number one target of the attack. The fact that it remained completely undamaged can only be explained by its exposed location on the ridge of the Kalstein. Within days of the attack, looting was in full swing. The Reich Security Service, the Obersalzburg administration, and the SS were disbanded. The last remaining SS guards were ordered to allow the locals to take anything useful from the ruins. Their relatives went back to their homes or hid in the surrounding mountain forests. Some of the furniture was taken away in trucks from the fleet of the Obersalzburg administration. Hitler's personal adjutant, Julius Schaub, was in charge of the destruction of all of the Führer's private documents. Julius Schaub burned bundles of letters, drawings, sketches, and other private documents belonging to Hitler on the terrace of the Berghof. He was the last person to leave the Berghof. On May 1st, 1945, a group of SS men set fire to the Berghof. 
However, the mysterious radio communication vehicle was still in the woods of the Obersalzburg. It continued to send messages. This time, however, not to Berlin. On this day at the beginning of May 1945, the radio car sent its last coded messages. For hours, only lists of names were transmitted and then came the final message. To Sargo and Luna. Transfer from GK to GS. Crocodile offline. Deregistration completed. According to a former member of the Secret Service, Sargo was the code name of the head of the SD spy ring in Argentina. Luna, also a code name, was active in the so called defense under Admiral Canaris in South America. It has been known for a long time that a large number of Nazi functionaries were sent to South America until 1946. Exactly which names were on the lists will forever remain a mystery. In any case, these were the last radio messages from the declining Third Reich. A few days later, the American 101st Airborne Division marched into Berchtesgaden after being handed over without a fight by the district administrator. The steep Obersalzberg Road led them to their unknown destination. Arriving at the guardhouse, the occupying forces were met with a scene of destruction. Once again, Obersalzberg was declared a restricted area, this time by the Americans. These photographs taken by an Allied war correspondent show how the bunkers were found by the Americans in May 1945. Hitler's bunker was equipped with all sorts of extras. A kennel for his favorite dog, Blondie. Caves for Hitler's many art treasures. A room for Hitler's valuable record collection. In total, the bunker had an area of almost 10,000 square feet. The air raid shelters on Obersalzburg were built under enormous time pressure. In only eight weeks, the 130-meter-long main corridor in Hitler's bunker and the adjoining caverns were completed, including the paneling and furnishings. The bunker facilities had been relatively spared by looters until then, much to the delight of the occupying forces. Due to its exposed location, the eagle's nest was completely spared from the looting. Within a few weeks, the entire inventory would become American war trophies. General Taylor noted in his diary at the time, Bud Harper could not cope with the increasing looting. Colonel Sink assembled a subunit and warned them on my behalf that looting was damned close to theft. Obersalzberg and the Eagle's Nest were literally dismantled by my men. Obersalzberg remained in the hands of the occupying forces until 1948. When the Americans returned Obersalzberg to the state of Bavaria, they made the demolition of the Nazi era ruins a condition. As a result, on April 13, 1952, the ruins of the Berghof and the houses of Bormann and Göring were blown up and dismantled by order of the Bavarian government. The Platterhof and the estate were used by the Americans as accommodation and administrative buildings for the recreational center of the armed forces, a place for U.S. soldiers and their families to relax and recuperate.
Their luxurious interiors were adapted to American servicemen's needs, and maintenance was limited to what was absolutely necessary. In 1996, the last of the American-administered buildings were returned to the free state of Bavaria. After more than 50 years of American administration, the free state takes over the properties in a desolate condition. Millions of dollars in renovations were needed, but no money was allocated and the properties were to be sold unrenovated. Foreign parties had expressed interest in the Hotel General Walker, formerly the Platterhof. However, the government was skeptical about how the new owners were going to use the building and refused to sell. On May 1, 1999, the Gewerbegrund Company from Munich leases an area of about 125 acres. It stretches from the former Haus Göring to the Platterhof and down to the Gutshof. On the Eckerbeichel, the former Göringhügel, a luxury hotel is to be built. First, all the ruins of the, the SS barracks, the Berghof and the Platterhof, are to be removed. The underground bunkers of the former SS barracks are to be filled in. In the fall of the same year, demolition work begins on the ruins of the Göring House. Six months later, the site of the former SS barracks is leveled, and the entrances to the bunkers are buried. Some of the demolition material is also used to fill in the ruins of the former Berghof. Even a citizen's initiative failed to prevent the Berghof from being demolished. During the demolition, a Bega film team found the original wooden ceiling of the old Steinhaus land under the plaster. Here is an old photo of the room from 1920. The date 1671 indicates that the old Steinhaus land had been rebuilt. Considering this date, it is incomprehensible that the building was not listed as a historical monument. This would not only have preserved the old structure of the Steinhaus land, but would also have saved the Platterhof from demolition. Despite several million dollar offers, the valuable marble door and window frames were smashed. It was a good deal for the Gewerbegrund company because the 99-year inheritance contract with the Free State of Bavaria even included reimbursing the demolition costs. The contract also stated that the buildings and ruins on the site in question were to be completely removed and that the demolition material was not to be used for any other purpose. Hubert Speer's house, which was spared in the bombing, is also owned by the Gewerbegrund Company. Spears' private house has since changed hands several times and is now owned by a private individual. The Eagle's Nest has been leased to the German Alpine Association since 1952 and is subleased as a restaurant. The Hotel Zum Turken also continued as a hotel. The property was bought back from the former owners in 1948 and has been in private ownership ever since. Only the former guest house Hoer Girl has been renovated and recently put to new use. Since 1999, this building has been home to the Obersalzburg Documentation Center. But what about the other buildings of the Third Reich? Since the end of the war, time has stood still in the bunkers. 
The ground plan was the same for all bunkers at that time. The width of the tunnels and the height of the corridors were the same. Embrasures, which also served as pressure buffers for exploding bombs, were located at the end of each corridor. Several gas locks with corresponding decontamination chambers were located in each of the bunkers. In case of contamination, people could be treated with washing and medicine. The caverns of the facilities were 3.5 meters wide, 2.80 meters high, and varied in length, from 12 to 15 meters. They were blasted out of the rock at right angles to the corridors. Beneath the floor of the main corridors was a walk-in utility shaft that carried water and sewer lines, electrical cables, and heating and air conditioning pipes. There were several side tunnels leading to emergency exits in each bunker system. Today, all of these emergency exits have been bricked up. Some of the bunkers were connected, such as the Berghof bunker and the bunker of the Reichssicherheitsdienst in the Hotel Zum Türken. Bormann's and Göring's bunkers were also to be connected, but Göring prevented this shortly before completion, as he wanted to be independent in this respect as well. For the construction of the bunkers, only the best materials were used. There was no shortage of materials. Radio systems were used to communicate with the outside world. Borman's bunker was equipped with every conceivable technical refinement. An air situation center was set up in a side section of the bunker, from which the anti-aircraft defenses of the Ober Salzburg could be directed. A huge map of Central Europe was drawn on a frosted glass pane. The air raids currently taking place could be clearly displayed here by means of indirect lighting. Detailed information about the underground bunkers on Ober Salzburg can be found in several bunker exploration videos, which are also available here on the Biga Film YouTube channel. Put back to daylight. The once bustling theater hall lies under a blanket of overgrown weeds. Gone are the days when thousands of workers used to gather within its walls to enjoy the films of Heinz Ruhmann or Theo Lingen. In 2001, the ruins you see here were removed. The ruins of the Moose Liner Tea House, once a victim of massive post-war looting, also disappeared without a trace. What remains are only memories, as the ruins shown here were also dismantled and removed in 2001. To this day, the mountain has not regained the tranquility of its original seclusion, and it is only a matter of time before the last remnants of its turbulent past are removed. And with this, we conclude our documentary on the bombing raids of Obersalzburg, a pivotal chapter in the history of this region. We hope that these insights have provided you with a deeper understanding of the events that unfolded here. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to explore more historical events, we'd appreciate if you could give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. This way, you'll stay updated on new content. And if you really like the work we do and want to support us directly, you can become a patron of this channel by following the Patreon link in the video description. Thank you for your support and interest. See you next time.